hear your favorite NFL legends sharing their stories and insights every week right here on Thursday Night Tailgate with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Take it away, guys. There's no way out. All right, now back with us and making his 11th appearance with us here on Thursday Night Tailgate, his former Saints 49ers and uh, Panthers defensive back and member of our 2016 Guest Hall of Fame class, Toy Cook. And Toy, you know, first joined us, folks, way back on March 1st of 2012, episode 24. And here we are almost at episode 350, six plus years later. Wow. Let me remind you about wow. his background. He's from Chicago and uh, he's a West Coast guy. He's a, He attended high school out in Van Nuys, California, played his college ball at Stanford, where he was a two-sport two star, member of their College World Series championship team in 1987. He was a, a three-year starter at defensive back, playing for uh, John Elway's father, Jack, from 1984 to 86. Drafted by the Twins in the 38th round in 1987, chose to go play football instead. He was an eighth-round pick by the Saints that same year, and he played in the league from 87 to 97 for the Saints 49ers and Panthers. He was a member of the 49ers Super Bowl championship team in 1994. I'm sure second to being in, in our guest Hall of Fame, he was inducted into Stanford's Hall of Fame back in 2014. And on top of being a great athlete, Toy is a really great guy and someone who's very special to, to us here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Toy, Chris and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Welcome back, Toy. Hey, hey, Chris and Bob, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, because these earphones are pretty terrible at my house. But thank you. Uh, glad to be back, and thank you for such a wonderful introduction, especially coming after Keith Hirschland, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> so, Toy, I want to start out our time with you tonight by by getting getting some of your thoughts on what's going on around the league, particularly with respect to rules changes. i got to imagine, as as a former defensive back, when you look at the possibility of changing the pass interference penalty, taking it, you know, from a spot foul to a 15-yard penalty, that's got to weigh highly with you. That's got to be the right thing for the league to do, no? That is the, the – well, you've heard me guys complain at uh, nauseum uh, on your show <laughs> about, you know, it's fourth and 20 or third and 20 and the deep fly – go route is incomplete, but wait, there's a flag. And, and even though this is not pass interference, it's a, whether it be a spot foul or that other foul where it's an automatic first down. But, yeah, to take away the, you know, deep ball, I mean, I think 50% of games are have been won or lost on those type of calls this year. So let's, let's take that in another sort of different direction, but in the same area, Toy. Let's the rule about a catch. What's a catch, Toy? How do we define a catch? It's, it's it, we define it by by calling by saying common sense. <laughs> I think it's mm-hmm. everything that uh, you know what a catch is. Everyone saw Des Bryant jump up in the air, catch the ball, and in an effort to get a first down, reach out with the ball, and then hit the ground and fumble. And we all knew that was a catch. And that costs the Dallas Cowboys uh, a game. So, yes, uh, Jerry Jones lost $2 million, uh in the lawsuit, but he gained <laughs> hopefully a catch that will pay back. But I don't think that's helping him. But we all know what a catch is. Uh, and it's common sense. And I think that they just made it hard. And this is, the, this is the, I think, the most fantastic thing is think about how hard they sold that before. <laughs> What was a catch and what's not a catch? And we all know that they were completely wrong, but they kept selling it. They kept selling it, and no one's calling them on the carpet for it. But think about that. Bob, questions for Toy? Just to come back. No, no I was going to say just to come back and say, oh, now it's a catch. But do you remember how hard they sold that that was not a catch? That's what I think is funny and ironic. And Toy, we, we're talking. We hear so much about they're they're trying to analyze what constitutes a catch and everything else. And, and when we talk about the pass interference, uh, we still there, there's still nothing cut and dried. Toy, we see replays where receivers are pushing off, uh, receivers are using their hands, and of course sometimes these guys are wrestling the receivers before they get down at a certain 
a yard line or whatever. I mean, it's it, it's so subjective, Toy. I mean, we could replay these things, but then then it would the game would even get longer than it. But uh, do you think they should be looking at what constitutes pass interference? Also, there is no question, Bob, that they should be looking at what constitutes pass interference. First of all. There are guys watching every single play, right? So they're concentrating on one play. The, the problem is all those guys that are making those calls are probably former receivers, right? They need to mix in some DBs in there, right? Or they need to sit in a room with DBs and receivers and have a healthy discussion as we look over film. I know they do it, and they do it with coaches, but when I was with the NFLPA and we'd go into the competition committee and we had these kind of arguments where I'd say where they, before you used to cover a receiver and as he goes to go up on the go route, you could cut him off. We call that the cutoff, right? And they took that away. That was a penalty. And I go, I tell you what, I'll give you the cutoff if I can put my hand down there and guide him, right? And, of course, the, the, the coaches that we were arguing against were offensive coaches. This is when, like, Holmgren was there. Uh, maybe Gruden, you know, so on that competition committee, it's the same thing like when you play, do you, if you want to be a defensive player, if you play for a defensive coach, because that's an extra spot on the roster, just the same as you want to be an offensive player if you have an offensive coach. So in that competition committee, in the past, it's been predominantly, and I remember one time, I think I want to say uh, Bill Cower was, I right? Bill, you're, you're a defensive guy, come on, help a guy out. So I think it's those kind of things which people don't know about that that dictate what we see as pass interference or not. And I think one of the way, Bob's, and I'm sorry for this long answer, but I think that they have to go into a room with both, you know, well-spoken players that can effectively explain what they're saying or even go to announcers. I'd be fine with announcers, you know, because I think that the, the, the announcers, Tony Romo and Troy Aikman, they know what pass interference. So I'd be fine with that too. And, Toy, we've talked in the past about you being a multi-sport athlete and uh, your your ultimate decision to play football. Remind our listeners uh, what put you over the edge and steered you toward football. Many guys who, who have the, the choices of playing both football or baseball, a lot of them will pick baseball now knowing what we do about the roughness of the game in football and, and the money involved also. But uh, to remind us why you went the football route. Um. The reason I went the football uh, route was, you know, I played two sports in college, and part of the reason was, I mean, I wanted to play both, and I thought I had a chance in both. But with football, it comes up first, uh, at least for me. And, you know, training camp is five weeks. And so you know right away either you're on the team or you're not on the team. And – uh, I figured if I didn't make football, I would always be able to go to, uh, you know, fall ball and baseball. And I, I knew it would only take me three years, but I wanted to see football. And I, I just think, I, I mean, I love football. I don't, I mean, I watch high school football. I watch college football. I don't, I mean, I love preseason. You know, we've had this conversation before, which is, you know, is preseason worth four games? And I go to those guys that are free agents. And guys are not high round picks. They need four games because the coaches, despite seeing everything that they've seen since spring and summer, still have a hard time deciding who's going to be on the team, and they don't make the right choice. And if you only gave them two games, 50% of the guys that end up having long careers would not make it. So uh, <laughs> I know we start on that other question, but I apologize for uh, digressing. So, Toy, let's let's take that a step further. Talk about the combine, value of the combine, seeing guys, you know, skills challenges and and you know pro days where guys in shorts and t-shirts are you know throwing routes versus what we see in game film. Talk about the value of that. I, you know, I, I just think that it's the opportunity when which you know evaluators and the fans get to finally see the players and, you know, what we could call controlled drills. And and that's all fine and dandy. You know, you get to see these guys run the 40. And, and the funny thing is I think they, they did it. They showed a thing with uh, Antonio Brown when he ran like a four five six, and he was the 
slower than like Cooper Cup and somebody else that ran a fast time, and he's impossible to cover. So while it's great to to be the fastest uh, guy there or have a lot of speed, uh, it also you know <laughs> you get to see the guys catching balls and lifting weights. And despite all of that, uh, the one thing that they're missing at the combine is the heart t- contest, as you know, seen by whether it be I don't even know if Malcolm Butler made it there. You know, uh, I really like the kid from, um, of course, I like all my Stanford guys, but uh, I like the, the the corner from Alabama. So for the people that don't get to see the players, this is the one time where you get to see the rookies coming in and performing, and it's kind of cool. So I actually I actually really like it, except for when I played, we were running in shorts and, like, basically boots. I mean, I was, and if I was playing now, I'd be running butt naked. I might run, like, 4-3-4. Four, four. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get your thoughts on uh, on Jimmy G. The, you know the Forty ers were one in ten. This kid steps in; they win five in a row. So your thoughts on Jimmy G and the Forty ers Are they now a contender? Do you think they're a top contender in the NFC West division next season? I I mean I think so. I think every team, the Cleveland Browns are a contender. <laughs> they're only a couple games away, um, but for sure. Jimmy G, uh, you know, Colin Coward was complaining. Someone was complaining. Oh, no, it, uh, it was Steve Mason was complaining about what the Niners gave Jimmy G. And I texted him and said, hey, you're a market guy. That's what the market dictated, right? I mean, could you imagine? I mean, last time I checked, and I don't care about the last game with the Rams, they had not won a game until they installed him. So, you know, scoreboard. 5-0, and oh. and he's been behind Tom Brady and then the, you know, at the Death Star with the Patriots, which is like, you know, the IMG Academy for pro football. So I think uh, he did great, and I think that the 49ers, uh, especially with, you know, John Lynch and uh, Shanahan, uh, that's a good combination. Uh, I think they have a chance. Toy, going back to your time in New Orleans, you're seventh all-time on their career list with 16 interceptions. And that same defensive backfield, when you came into the league in 87, you had George Atkins and Johnny Poe, who are also fourth and sixth, respectively, on the Saints' all-time interceptions list. Talk about what it was like teaming up with those guys. Well, George Atkins actually was not there then. We had Gene Atkins. Gene Atkins. Right, which I think that's who, that's all right. Because I was like, man, that's what the George Atkinson. I am part of this concussion lawsuit, so I may not be able to remember that far back. But, yeah, I got to play with uh, Gene Atkins, uh, Johnny Poe, Brett Maxey, uh, one of my favorite players. Um, uh, it, it, you know, my favorite story of that whole group, uh, at least my, of the many stories, is my, our first defensive back coach was Don Capers. Uh, and we all know about Don Capers. He was my defensive back coach for five years. And then the next guy to come in there was uh, Jimmy Mora, uh, J.L. Moore, the former uh, UCLA coach and son of Jim. Uh, so I used to joke that if you coach me, you would be a head coach. I'm a head coach maker. I'm just like some players, or <laughs> we call them, we call them, you know, they, they get people fired. I get people hired. Sonny Lubick was my defensive back coach. My senior year, his first year coach would be head coach. <laughs> so, so uh, it was it was it was fun to play. Like what Brett Maxey is uh, is a coach with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, really smart player. We saw uh, with Gene, and he's the father of Geno Atkins, uh, Milton Mack from Alcorn State, and Rob, uh, Mike Adams, Vince Buck, Robert Massey. Uh, I got to play with a bunch of great guys uh, in New Orleans. So. Uh, uh, and, I, once again, there's no question that one of the reasons I was able to play 11 uh, years was the foundation that uh, Jim Mora, Steve Sedwell, who you guys should have a great defensive coordinator. So, like, when I run into these guys, whether it be uh, Mike Tomlin or, or Marvin Lewis or even John uh, Gruden, so when you run up to him, I, or I met Bill Belichick, and I go, my first defensive coordinator was Steve Sidwell. Boom, I'm in because he knows Steve Sidwell and the history of the coaches that we had on that staff. 
Vic Fangio was our outside linebacker. So of my 11 years, I got to spend nine of them, seven with him in New Orleans and then two in Carolina where he was uh, our defensive coordinator. So uh, I was really blessed to have smart coaches that recognized my talent, and it all started in New Orleans with Jim Mora, Steve Sidwell, Don Capers, uh, Vic Fangio, uh, Joe Marciano, who was our special teams coach, and uh, John Pease. So I, when, I, and when I say those names, which may not mean anything to your listeners, but in the pantheon of coaches, uh, that's like it's like gold. Toy, before we let you go, let our listeners know how can they stay up to date with all the great things that you're doing now. Um, they can find me on Twitter. I think I'm at Toy Cook. Is, uh, despite going to say you are. I'm probably, uh, yeah, I have, I have. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I. I, uh, I, I do know I am following you guys, uh, both you and Chris. So um, they can find me through you guys, which is always the, the best way I tell people. Uh, so that's that's me. Toy, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come back and join us on the show and for all your support over the years. Again, way back, you know, in 2011 is when you, when you first joined us. You think about – you know where we where we started out on you know going back to you with on episode 24 here we are on almost on episode 350 your support has been fantastic we can't thank you enough for for all of that and being a a part of our guest hall of fame and then uh, of course your time here tonight you're the best my friend hey but hey bob uh chris thank you so much you know i, I love being in the show you guys let me ramble and go off in all kinds of divergence uh, it's just strange, but it's always great. And you have, and you guys have great guests. I mean, I love. I usually try to get on ten minutes early just so I can hear who you guys are talking to, and I learn something about Keith Hirschling. Uh And we have a project called Vault Media uh, that I'm going to be reaching out to him very soon. I told great. you I'm always. Uh, hopefully, one day you guys will be uh, on some television show that I'm producing with Keith Hirschling. And uh, <laughs> that's what we should be working on. Agreed. From from your lips to God's ears, Toy. We're all in on that, hey, by the way. You got you got to say it. We got to believe it. We put it out there. It's going to happen. There you go. We appreciate you, my friend. Take care. All the best to you and your hey, family. We look thanks, forward to guys. catching back up with you again soon, Toy. Thanks, Toy. Hey, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Chris. Have a great one. Good night, man. All right, you too, Toy. That is uh, former Saints 49ers, Panthers, and going back to his college days, Stanford, Toy Cook, and uh, and, a, and a wonderful guest in our hall, or one of our Hall of Famers, Bob. You you look at a guy that has that much talent, right? Could have played baseball if he wanted to, right? Won a title in college, you know, in baseball. Went out, won a Super Bowl with the with the 49ers, and then uh, just you know just listening to him, right? I mean, you know, the guy's you know one of the smartest people we know. And uh, one of the best guests that we've ever had. I mean, I, I don't know any more superlatives that you could throw at Toy Cook, but uh, they all belong to him. That's why he's in our Hall of Fame, Chris. Uh, very accommodating, incredibly intelligent. And, uh, again, great stories, a long career. We could talk forever with him, and we will continue to do so as long as he makes it happen. It's always an honor to talk to that man. When Bob and I come back, we'll be turning on our Thursday night tailgate spotlight on the positive. Hear which players are doing great things out there in their communities. We'll do that. We'll wrap up the show, and that's all going to come on the other side about these words from our friends at the Salt Creek Golf Retreat and Double Back Winery and the great smooth voice of Joe Lajanusa. <laughs> 